Jack. They were seven months out of college now, but nearly everyone at the New Year's Eve party was still getting drunk on cheap beer, just as they had done for the last four years. Only this time they sported glittery glasses and festive hats. Standing in the living room of their friend's DC apartment, Jack and Javi were in the same space together for the first time since Javi had left for Alabama, and Jack could instantly sense the change in him. Javi seemed confident and self-assured, regaling the group with tales from his first months of aviation training. He even looked taller than Jack remembered. And then, with zero warning, the pilot flips the plane upside down and does two spins in a row. The guy next to me vomits all over the side of the plane, and I couldn't eat a thing for the rest of the day, Javi laughed, but apparently we'll get used to it. Jack was struck by how different Javier's life had become. His friend was flying across the sky, learning how to conduct dangerous missions, while Jack was working a safe desk job in cyber operations. Though his daily tasks felt more administrative than operative, his short string, a barrier to any high-level clearance. Hey, one of the guests interrupted the group, looking down at his phone. Wes Johnson just released a new video. Is he dropping out of the race? A girl asked. Why would he drop out? He's still lagging behind Rollins. Yeah, but a lot of people are pretty mad with Rollins. The boy looked up at Jack, abruptly, abruptly recalling his connection. No offense, man. Jack waved it off. I'm on his campaign site now, said another guest. Jack and Javi joined the group that gathered to watch. Wes Johnson sat in a leather armchair in what appeared to be his home office, decorated with family photos and framed diplomas and bookshelves packed with biographies. I'm going to keep this brief so everyone can get back to enjoying the holiday, Johnson said. I know there have been some calls for me to withdraw my candidacy, but I am here to assure you that I remain deeply committed to this campaign. I have discovered a new cause during my time on the trail, and I promise I will never stop fighting for all Americans with short strings and for anyone else who feels mistreated or marginalized by those in power. He leaned forward in his seat, closer to the camera. I know that, since the boxes arrived, it's often felt like we've been moving backwards, but the reason I wanted to say something tonight, of all nights, is because this moment on the verge of a new year is the only time when our entire world comes together in the hope for a fresh start and a better tomorrow. And I remain as hopeful as ever for the people of our great nation. I too have been following the many stories and voices of the Strong Together movement and I invite you to place all of that energy and compassion and bravery, and most importantly, all of that hope into this campaign. I promise this fight isn't over. The crowd grew still in the wake of Johnson's statement until one of the more inebriated party goers slurred. I stink and love that guy. But it sounds like he knows he's losing. No way. Haven't you heard about that huge Strung Together event next month? Apparently it's happening all over the world. I've heard Johnson is involved. That just sounds like a big PR stunt for short stringers, someone rolled their eyes. A whole lot of hype for nothing. It's much bigger than that, you'll see. I don't know, a boy said, turning toward Jack. Your uncle may be a son of a gun, but at least he's tough. He could actually get stuff done. Plus, he's brutally honest. You gotta respect that. Jack shifted uncomfortably in his shoes, grateful when someone yelled, Shots! from across the room, and the group quickly dispersed. It had been weeks since Jack had last attended a campaign stop. His aunt had delivered the news in person, disinviting Jack from all future events, sealing his destiny to be cast aside. Jack still saw his father occasionally, as long as Anthony wasn't around, but he had come to realize that the family he was losing now wasn't really worth belonging to. At least not anymore. Maybe when Grandpa Cal was alive, the hunters still stood for courage and country.
But with Anthony and Catherine now at the helm, it was purely self-interest, winning at all costs. Javier was the one who was actually carrying on the original Hunter legacy, committing his whole life to service in spite of its unjust brevity. Before she left Jack's apartment for the final time, Catherine had even tried to excuse her husband. Look, Jack, I know this must be incredibly hard for you, she said, but you have to trust me. Your uncle knows that not all short stringers are dangerous. He's just trying to protect us from the ones that are. Anthony the Defender, guardian of the long stringers, the man who would keep America safe, who would rule with an iron string. Something had changed recently, that much was true. And perhaps Jack's interruption at his uncle's rally had played a small part in that. But Anthony was still unstoppable, Jack thought, no matter how many times strung together might be typed out on a keyboard. No matter how big this mysterious event might be, no matter how hopeful Johnson may feel. How incredible that one dastardly clever performance, Anthony holding up his string back in June, had snowballed so fiercely over the past six months as the shootings and the bombing left people scared and vulnerable, as the failed attack in Manhattan turned Anthony into a hero, as Wes Johnson's short string made him look weak and as many a downtrodden long stringer listened to Anthony and finally felt powerful at the expense of his short string brothers. How could this new movement, only just gaining ground, be enough to reverse all of that? With the rest of the party goers taking shots of tequila, Jack and Javi were left alone. I meant to call, Javi said, but they've kept us so busy. This is literally my first break in months. It sounds like it's going really well, Jack said. It is, Javi smiled. So, how angry was your uncle after what you did? I think he's fully renounced me as his nephew, Jack said, but at least he stopped talking about my string. Javi nodded. You know, you once told me that I was twice the man you are, but that sure took a lot of balls, he said, laughing. The debris from their fight still lingered in the air, tainting their words with an awkwardness that never existed before, and Jack wondered if things would ever return to normal, to the smooth and easy nature of their early days as friends. Hey, isn't that old vet's bar somewhere around here? Jack asked. You want to grab a beer? The two of them stealthily retrieved their coats and snuck out the front door. Just a few blocks away stood an old-timey dive, with dark wood walls and dark green booths and all manner of military paraphernalia hanging from the ceiling. It was almost exclusively patronized by veterans, and whenever Jack and Javi entered the bar in their uniforms or old academy garb, they were welcomed heartily with tipped caps and raised mugs. Javi was wearing his army jacket, so tonight would be no exception. The crowd at the bar was thinner than usual, mostly comprised of elderly men wearing caps embroidered with Vietnam or Korea, plus a few younger soldiers in camo. On the television screens above, the celebrities hosting the night's entertainment were reflecting on the year that was ending. Well, to say this year has been a momentous one would be quite the understatement, one of the well-coiffed men joked. Here's hoping that next year doesn't bring any new surprises, Jack and Javi settled into a booth and spent the next hour reminiscing about their college years, the classes they had almost failed, the girls they should have asked out, the training days when they had both their butts kicked so hard that it hurt to sit down and stand up. The memories somehow seemed further in the past than they actually were, and Jack wondered if this was adulthood, if life moved so much more quickly after you've grown up. It was Jack who ultimately brought up the fight. I'm sorry it took me so long to do something, he said, to do anything. And there's plenty more to be done, Javi said, but I lashed out at you for a lot of reasons, a lot of hurt, not all of which were your fault. And maybe I should have taken more responsibility for the switch in the pressure it put on both of us. It's not like you forced me to do it. It was mutual. But you don't regret it? Jack asked. 
Javi took a sip of his beer, considering the question. I love the other guys I'm training with, and I have a lot of respect for the officers, so it's really tough to keep lying to them. But I wouldn't be there without it, Javi said. I wouldn't be able to save people's lives someday. He smiled and shook his head, like he almost couldn't believe it. And no matter what went down after the switch, I guess I'll always have you to thank for that. Well, like you said, it wasn't just me. It was mutual. Eventually, the bartender started shouting across the room, 10, 9, 8, 7. The dozen or so strangers in the bar exchanged eager glances, joining in on the count. Six, five, four. Jack reached into his pocket for the two small kazoos he had stolen from the party earlier, handing one to Javi. Three, two, one. The two friends blew on their mini instruments while the rest of the crowd cheered, Happy New Year, in unison. Then, at the farthest end of the bar, one of the oldest gentlemen began to sing, timidly and off-key, but with an earnestness that held everyone's attention. Should old acquaintance be forgot and never brought to mind? Soon enough, every voice in the place was lifting his up. Should old acquaintance be forgot in day's odd log sign? As he sang, Jack thought about his aunt and uncle, who were no doubt clinking champagne flutes at a mansion just a few miles away, and about Wes Johnson, perhaps home with his family, resting after months on the road, wondering if he could still win. We too have paddled in the stream from morning sun to night, but the seas between us broad have roared from all long sign. And Jack thought about his best friend Javier, admirably humming the tune in the places where he didn't know the words and toasting the dawn of another year, even when the passage of time might not feel like something to celebrate. Jack didn't know if Javi had forgiven him or if his words on that stage had been spoken too late to ever merit his forgiveness. As long as Jack didn't ask, he didn't have to face the answer. All Jack could do now was hope that Javi knew he was sorry and knew that he was trying. We'll take a cup of kindness yet for all long sign. Ben. The whole world, it seemed, had gathered. Everyone waiting to see what would unfold in this moment that had been spoken about and tweeted about and wondered about for weeks. The locations had been revealed just three days prior with hubs in two dozen countries, like a map mounted in a traveler's home, thumbtacks pinned on nearly every continent. It was the first time that the disparate voices of strung together had apparently managed to converge to sing in one global chorus, and everyone wanted to know who was behind it, the organizers still anonymous. The names of Silicon Valley innovators and outspoken celebrities were whispered alongside prominent NGOs and local mayors and white hat hackers. Many wondered if Wes Johnson had lent his support. And what about that girl from the viral video? The mystery only deepened the marvel. Ben's entire group had turned out that day, along with Nina, Amy, and a friend of Nihal's, all standing shoulder to shoulder in Times Square where the city had celebrated the new year en masse only a few weeks earlier. It was cold, but nobody seemed to mind, not with the presence of thousands of bodies, breathing into cupped hands, eagerly tapping their feet. It started a minute past 9 a.m. in New York. It was morning in the Americas, afternoon in Europe and Africa, and evening in the Asia Pacific. All the screens in Times Square went black, before flashing the words strung together across their digital faces. The crowd erupted in cheers. As Ben watched the display commence in Manhattan, he wondered fleetingly about the other countries, unaware that the very same video was being viewed by all. Playing across the LED billboards of London's Piccadilly Circus and Tokyo's Shibuya Crossing and Toronto's Yong Dundas Square projected onto screens in building facades in Mexico City's Zocalo, 
in Cape Town's Green Market Square, in Paris's Place de la Bastille. Streaming live with no delays on Facebook and YouTube and Twitter. Even the Google homepage had been taken over in that instant, the letters of its rainbow logo linked by two twisting threads. Today, around the world, we honor the contributions of those with short strings, the video began, the stark white words like stars on a midnight screen. These are just a few. Saved 200 lives in surgery. Raised three children on her own. Directed an Oscar-winning film. Earned two PhDs. Built an iPhone app. With each tribute, each triumph, the applause grew louder. Married his high school sweetheart. Wrote a novel. Defended our country. Ran for president. Ben looked around at the members of his group and wondered what the video might say for each of them. Nihal had been valedictorian. Mora was newly married. Carl was an uncle. Leia was carrying her brother's babies. Terrell was producing a Broadway show, and Chelsea made everyone laugh. Hank, of course, had been a healer. And there were a million other things as well that Ben still didn't know about these people, despite all the time they had spent together, sitting in room 204. They had each fallen in and out of love, held jobs both dull and fulfilling. They were sons and daughters and brothers and sisters. They were friends. We love you, someone shouted near Ben. Strung together, yelled another. This wasn't what Ben had expected. He assumed that he would hear platitudes from government leaders or actors. He assumed they would plead for tolerance. He assumed they might show photos of short stringers already lost. He assumed the day would feel heavy and sad, a prolonged moment of silence, like one massive memorial service. But it wasn't like that at all. It was boisterous and raucous and joyful, a celebration of life, an hour of untouched unity. In every location, every country, every public square, people leaned out of windows and stepped onto balconies and climbed up to rooftops, clapping and hollering and banging the rails. For a nation, for a world, with no trouble starting wars and stoking fears and standing together, they hadn't forgotten how to come together. Mora. Later, by the next morning, Mora would realize that it was perfectly, almost laughably, well-timed. That something, fate perhaps, had allowed them to enjoy that moment in Times Square, blissfully and without disruption, before the panic set in. The video had ended mere minutes before, and the people in the street and the windows above were still screaming and cheering, riding the currents of revelry, when Leia's face went ashen. Are you okay? Mora asked her. I think my water just broke. Within seconds, Mora had rallied the group, forming a circular shield around Leia and pushing their way through the thicket of people. But the crowd was dense and the celebrants oblivious and the pace unbearably slow. Ben was hurriedly dialing Leia's brother and parents, and Mora glanced at her poor pregnant friend, who was trying to hold it together while contractions started pulsing through her body. Please get me out of here, Leia begged. I don't want to give birth in the Hard Rock Cafe. Everybody move, Mora shouted. She's in labor. After an agonizing, indefinite number of minutes, the group would argue, that night, over how long they had actually been in Times Square, they reached the edge of the mob and Carl hailed a cab. When it stopped, Ben and Terrell gently loaded Leia into the back of the taxi. I can't go alone, she shouted. The members of the group exchanged rapid glances before Mora, seeing the squeamish faces and terrified eyes of her friends, quickly slid into the back of the cab, giving directions to the driver. Leia spent most of the ride attempting to stifle her screams, strands of hair already sticking to the sweat on her forehead. Without any makeup, her cheeks pink and flushed, Leia looked so young, Mora thought. Only a girl. It seemed almost unfair to put her through such pain. 
Just keep breathing, Morris said calmly, not quite sure if that was right. Did someone call my... Ah! Leia's words crumbled into groans. Your whole family's on their way, Mora answered, rubbing the top of Leia's white-knuckled hand, which seemed permanently fused to her seatbelt. It'll all be worth it once they're born, Leia moaned, placing her hands on her belly, and we're all going to love them so much. Mora was surprisingly moved by the girl's sense of assurance, the love that already flowed out of her. Nothing about Leia's current ordeal seemed appealing, but the thought still flickered within Mora, what she and Nina might be missing. In a rare minute of reprieve from the pain, Leia whispered, I'm so happy that I could do this for my brother. He's always been so good to me, and he's going to make a great dad. They both are. And no matter what, Leia tipped her head down toward her stomach, I'll always be a part of their story. But the beauty of the moment was broken by a passing contraction as Leia clutched Mora's hand. We're almost at the hospital, Mora said. You'll have pain meds in no time. Leia shook her head vigorously. No drugs. Are you crazy? I want to feel it, Leia said breathlessly. But you're about to push two human beings out of your body. I just want to know if it's true. If it's true that it hurts? Mora asked. I think you already got your answer. Leia finally cracked a smile, her lips already chapped. If it's true what I've heard, she said, that it hurts like heck when you're going through it, but once it's over, you can't even remember the pain. By the time Leia and Mora arrived at the hospital, Leia's family had thankfully appeared, relieving Mora's hand from any more squeezing. When she walked over to the waiting room, massaging her fingers back to life, Mora was stunned to see the entire support group gathered. Chelsea was sitting down next to Sean, her mascara slightly smudged. Terrell had somehow managed to smuggle in a bottle of champagne, bragging to Nihal about his exploits. Even grumpy Carl showed up. And Mora joined her wife, standing now beside Ben and Amy, the three of them still in awe after the morning's event. This is turning into quite the day, Nina said. How's Leia doing? Ben asked. She's got a way to go, said Mora, but she's stronger than you think. The following hours oscillated between caffeine and adrenaline fueled highs and a strange mixture of anxiety and tedium. When the whales were at last heard in the waiting room, Mora was returning from a coffee run, and she paused as she came upon the scene, Terrell pouring champagne into paper cups, Sean and Nihal high-fiving, Chelsea jumping up and down, her heeled boots clapping against the floor. It was then that Mora realized this group of strangers had remarkably formed a family, one that mourned together when Hank died and celebrated together now as Leia brought two lives into the world. Mora placed the coffee down on a nearby table and snuck up on Nina from behind, hugging her and kissing her neck, leaning into the warm feeling of the moment. There you are, Nina smiled. You almost missed it. But she hadn't missed it, Mora realized. What she had witnessed in the cab, what Leia felt for her babies, that was love in its most pure and intense form. And Mora hadn't missed out on that. Her arms, still bristling with energy, were, in fact, far from empty, wrapped as they were around Nina. A few minutes later, the door swung open and Leia's brother walked out. A boy and a girl, he declared, looking awestruck by the fact. How auspicious, Mora thought, to be born on this day when the world came together for one briefly luminous moment. And the group of people in the waiting room, giddy with delight and a little bit of booze, welcomed the newborn twins into their fold, the newest residents of Earth, the latest members in a world of unimaginable pain and unfathomable joy, the two poles never so far from one another. When Mora had a chance to visit Leia's recovery room, Leia looked up toward her, eyes brimming. Thank you for being there, she said. It was my pleasure, said Mora, watching one of the twins rest in the nook of Leia's arm, both of them equally exhausted and equally at ease with each other. Mora could practically read the answer in the curves of Leia's body, all inclining toward the baby, but still she was curious. 
Is it true? Mora asked. And Leia just smiled puckishly, as if privy to the greatest secret of all.